Idea Festival. It's a great honor to be here. This is my second time at an Idea Festival, so apparently they liked it enough to bring me back. This is good news. I'm also happy to see you guys got your lunch. It's always terrible to be the last guy before lunch because nobody really cares about what you have to say. They just want to know what's for lunch. So hopefully you'll have this beautiful association, delicious food, Dr. Yampolsky. It's going to work out. Uh, I'll start by telling you guys the same thing I always tell my audience. You can follow me on Twitter. I post a lot of interesting news stories on this topic. If you're interested to learn more, it's a great option. You can also follow me on Facebook. You absolutely cannot follow me home. It's very important. I want to make sure some of you tried before. I want to. Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, my research. It's kind of intersection of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So uh, let's see if this works. It works. Uh, I'll tell you what superintelligence is. We'll consider the question, can it be dangerous? And what can we do about it? So the cool part about this talk is that it's not just my research, and I'm interested in it. It's something you all should be interested in. It's going to impact every single one of you in some way, and probably soon. OK? So first, I'm going to kind of give you an introduction, what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll say something which is not very controversial. I'll claim that artificial intelligence is already here. How many of you have a smartphone, Siri inside one of those intelligent agents? That's artificial intelligence. Uh, if you're using Google, if you've seen Watson, if you ever, you know, been to California, you see self-driving cars, all that is artificial intelligence. We have a problem in the field where as soon as we succeed at something, we stop calling it AI. We call it something else. So maybe you used a spell checker at some point. That was an AI project. Now that everyone has one, nobody thinks of it as artificial intelligence. People think, oh, it's a program. So actually, a lot of things around you are artificial intelligence. We also kind of know how to build robots. So we have brains, and we know how to make bodies. You don't see as many of them, depends on where you live, some places have more of them. But in general, we understand how to create humanoid robots capable of walking around, assisting in the houses. And there is a lot of government funding for additional research for robot soldiers, for rescue robotics, and so on. So that's another argument I'm making. Robots are here. So what is next? We got AI, we got robotics. I claim that we're going to get to the next level of intelligence, uh, which is human level. So machines not just capable of helping us in very narrow domains, but universal intelligence, just like a human being is, and beyond. So capable of solving any problem and doing it better than a human. So maybe you have IQ of 200. Think of machines going beyond that. So really, really smart intelligent systems. And capable of outperforming human beings in all domains, including science and engineering, and programming, and robotics. That's very important. So why do I think that's next? There is a number of reasons. So one, funding for this type of research. There is unprecedented level of funding for reverse engineering human brain for artificial intelligence. We're talking billions of dollars from the White House, from European Union, from private corporations like Google and other companies. So we have money. We have some of the smartest people in, in the world working on it. I mean, Google employees are pretty smart. If you ever had a chance to meet their research people, it's very impressive. So we got human intelligence. We got resources. We got uh, conferences in the field coming up. It'd be very surprising if we did not succeed at some point. And of course, everyone wants to know how soon it's going to happen. So. If you read predictions, different people, philosophers, scientists have different guesses. Nobody really knows. It could be five years, could be 200 years. Everything I'm going to tell you does not depend on guessing this number right. It's irrelevant. The conclusions we're going to come to are exactly the same, whatever it is, in five years or 100 years. We'll still have the same problems. We'll still need the same solutions. There are people who do a very good job at predicting technology. Ray Kurzweil is one of them. He creates those beautiful exponential curves showing power of computing as it moves forward. Every year we double the number of 
transistors, capacity, communication speed, whatever digital technology you look at, we see exponential improvements. And if you look at this chart, and I'm sure you can't see any of it from the back, but if you get it somewhere else, like from a Time magazine and look at it, he's predicting at which point we're gonna get to simulate in terms of computing capacity, animal brains, human brains, all of humanity together. And that's excellent way of predicting at which point computers will be as smart as people. So his charts are about kind of standard $1,000 desktop. If we look at supercomputing, the fastest computers, government uh, level computing facilities, the capacity is much greater, thousands of times greater. And we can map that capacity again on what it takes to simulate a single brain cell, single neuron, a subset of a brain, or a whole brain completely. And again, the numbers are similar. We're looking at 2023, 2025 uh, for you know, emulating all of humanity together, not just a single brain. We can also look at the next uh, paradigm in computing, which is quantum computing, which is even faster than that. So we're not just talking exponential, we're talking hyper-exponential improvements in capacity. So again, it'd be very surprising if uh, hardware was the bottleneck to getting to human level intelligence. So here is a simple chart showing the situation right now. We are at the point, we don't know how far that point is, right before computers hit human level performance. What happens after that point is kind of interest of mine and uh, part of this talk in terms of outcomes, then we get to super intelligence. Notice also that there is a feedback cycle between our hardware capacity and intelligence levels. More intelligent systems help us design more powerful computers. More powerful computers help us run more intelligent systems. So there is a cycle, self-improvement cycle. I want to discuss what those systems will represent in terms of their capacity. So I'm talking about getting to super intelligence, what makes it super anything. So one, those systems are super smart. You probably heard about computers beating people in games, chess, Jeopardy. This week specifically, there is a huge tournament in a game of Go. Google is dominating uh, human players, so I should really update my slides. Uh, but those are narrow domain instances. So yeah, computer knows how to play chess and nothing else. The new system from Google DeepMind, the one playing Go right now, is actually somewhat universal. You can retrain it to work in other domains without you know, making individual changes to the source code. You just provide it with data, and the system learns to function in almost any domain better than a human expert. Those systems are also super fast. So yeah, obviously computers are faster than humans, no doubt about it, your calculator is faster than you. But in terms of creating events, think of stock market. You may realize, you know, uh, stock value went up or down, couple seconds, came back. We're talking here nanoseconds, where the stock market crashed, recovered, maybe crashed again. You won't even notice something happening while machines, you know, obliterated a trillion dollars worth of wealth. So that's another very important advantage machines have over us, super speeds. There is also complexity. How many of you have commercial airline pilot's license? I don't have one either, but when I look at something like that, that's the menu. That's basically what you need to look at at all times to figure out what's going on with your system. Computers are very good at this. They can monitor thousands of variables at any given moment. Human beings can do one, two, three, four, five, maybe with some training. So this creates problems. And the complexity of source code behind it is very comparable. A lot of that source code is never even tested by the pilot. Even experienced pilots sometimes never get to experience certain components of a system. So what does that uh, present for us? It presents a problem in terms of emergency situations. We had already cases where airplanes crashed because the pilot couldn't handle complexity of the system. 
They didn't know how to address a specific situation. Computers are also becoming super controlling. You may not realize it, but already today, I'm not talking future and supercomputing, super intelligence, already today, they control majority of stock trades, over 80%. They control nuclear power plants, uh, military, missile control defense systems, autopilots, utilities, all that is now controlled by machines. And it's, again, so complex that we can't really take control back. No human can understand fully how the systems work and take over. Majority of funding for AI-related research comes from military. So it's not surprising that a lot of those systems are built for, what do military do? Some sort of uh, mission, critical operations. You're sending drones in, you're sending soldiers in. A lot of it is weapons, systems designed to kill people, destroy infrastructure. So that's something in particular we should worry about. Most likely the most advanced systems, early systems, will be developed in this domain. How will that impact wars? How will that impact every one of us? I'm not going to get into science fiction movies, but you all seen Terminator, so you know what's happening. There is also uh, similar problems with software, purely software aspects. Uh, we can call them cyber weapons. Uh, I'm sure all of you had a computer virus at some point. Even if you have a firewall, have your computer vir antivirus software, it happens. What happens when we combine most advanced computer viruses with intelligence, social engineering capacity, social engineering attacks against humans? Again, I don't know if you can see most of the stable, but if you can, we're seeing a huge increase in number of infected machines, amount of damages growing, again, almost exponentially, billions of dollars. And if a system like that is capable of taking down the internet, it will have significant consequences, not just financial, but even human life and so on. The maybe good news, maybe not so good news is that those machines are also very good workers. You probably heard about automation of most uh, tasks, especially manual labor, and business people love them. They don't need vacations, they don't need 401k. There is very few cases of sexual harassment with robots. I don't know if it's gonna continue. I hear the robosexuals out there, but uh, this is definitely something we don't have to worry about yet. So far, people who lost jobs to machines were mostly doing repetitive manual labor, factory assembly lines. Now we're starting to see similar process start taking place with people who work in cognitive fields, doing some sort of mental labor. Uh, my prediction is, is that this process will continue until all jobs are fully automated. So I kind of give you some somewhat negative things about what this technology might bring us. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only thing it will bring. About half the things it will bring us, by definition, will be positive or super positive. So we can talk about you know, great progress in science and unification of physical theories. We can talk about breakthrough in medical research, curing cancer, AIDS. Uh, Economically, this is amazing. You have free labor, not just physical, but mental free labor. So that's trillions of dollars of wealth generated. And in fact, if you look at that little chart in the corner, there are some things we don't even know about what to expect. We can't even predict what such a system might invent. So it could be a very, very positive future for all of us. That being said, I'm not too worried about positive things. You don't have to really prepare for positive outcomes. If you found $100, you're good. You don't have to have a plan for it. If you lost money, you need a backup plan. If something negative happens, you need to be ready for it. So there is quite a few possible negative implications from this technology. So all the things we talked about can be flipped into a negative domain. You have huge technological unemployment. Billions of people lose jobs. You have problems with uh, systems taking over political control. Maybe it's an improvement given our current situation, but we'll see about that. 
And again, we have the same chart in a corner, unknown unknowns. I can't even think about all the inventions a super intelligent system can come up with, and probably half of them will be very negative for humanity. So I want to give you some examples of how those systems can fail. What can go wrong? So you have managed to get access to a super intelligent system. Maybe you build one, maybe you stole one. I don't know what you did. Typically, a first order to such a system is something like, well, make everyone happy. Seems like a good idea. Everyone wants to be happy. And we as people immediately know what that order means. I want to be healthy, wealthy, handsome, lots of friends. We understand what that command entails. If you are a machine, you don't have the same human common sense as we do. You're just looking at final outcome and consider all possible pathways to get there. So if you study mathematics, there are ways to satisfy requirements of an equation with uh, trivial solutions like zero. If you kill all people, all people in the world are happy, by definition. There are drugs, there are surgical procedures you can implement to get people very happy, very happy. But it's not what we have in mind. So that's uh, what some call perverse instantiation, where you give a system specific order, but it misinterprets how to get there. So I call this situation a singularity paradox. You have a super intelligent system, super capable, super fast, super smart, but it doesn't even have basic human common sense, something a 10-year-old should have. To better understand why it happens, I have this chart here showing possible mind designs. So you typically think of humans as an example of intelligence. Maybe you consider some animals to be intelligent to a certain degree. But the real possible space of those designs is much greater. It's a whole universe. It's infinite in all directions. So you can think, well, maybe we have aliens out there. They'll have a completely different way of thinking about stuff. Maybe we'll evolve systems using genetic algorithms. Maybe we'll design AI systems. All of them would be completely different in their design, architecture, goals from humans. To give you an idea, that little tiny blue dot there is all of us, all whatever, seven billion people we have, because we are almost identical. We don't think about it that way, then we communicate, oh, he's so weird and different from me. But really, we are almost identical. We want the same things, we're afraid of the same things, Whereas if you look at the distance from this uh, little blue dot, there are systems which are completely different in their views of the world, what they want from the world, how to get there. So this should give you an idea, not just about difference in capacity, difference in intelligence, but difference in fundamental goals and uh, common sense. Some of us share it, others do not, but Still, all of us fit within that little blue dot, whereas machines would be greatly outside of it. So realizing the situation, a lot of people started writing books on the topic. In the last couple years, you saw books come out from philosophers, computer scientists. I wrote a book, buy my book. Uh, it seems to be a very hot topic right now. And for the first time ever, people are not just looking at how great it's going to be to have you know, free labor and robots around us, but also, can it create problems? And if so, what can be done about it? It also helped a lot that some very famous people started saying things about this domain. So I always joke about you know, this unemployed guy and a car salesman and a physicist talking about artificial intelligence. But they are, of course, very knowledgeable about the situation with technology. They are heads of top companies. They are at the cutting edge of uh, research. So a lot of people started listening to my message. I've been saying it for years, but now that there is some backing, a lot more people are interested in this topic and consider it something serious uh, worth discussion. As a result of this, again, in the last few years, a number of institutes uh, started specifically to address this problem. So now all the top universities, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, uh, they're all starting to have 
an institute dev uh, devoted specifically to AI safety research or more broadly existential risk from different technologies, whatever it's nanotech, synthetic biology, robotics, genetic engineering, all those technologies have both positive and negative side to how they can be applied. So that's very refreshing to see this uh, great uh, you know, birth of a new field. And so me and a colleague, we decided we need to create some sort of a baseline from which people can start doing research in this area. So it's a new field. It's important to bring new researchers in. How can we quickly get them up to speed so they know what's been done so far, what's been said, what problems are remaining? So we put together this survey paper. It's available completely for free online. You can Google it. And we surveyed everything people said about this topic we could find. Interestingly, some early uh, research on it started in 1863. Guy wrote about you know, fighting machines and making sure they don't kill us. Think about that. So it's been around for a while as a problem. What I want to do today, I, I obviously can't survey everything I uh, discovered there. I want to give you some ideas about what people think about in terms of solutions. And maybe you can see how inadequate those solutions are and how important it is to devote more resources to this problem. So here's the first solution. I don't have a picture for it because it's literally do nothing. People don't think it's a problem. They don't think we're going to get there. We're not going to get to intelligent machines. Or if we get there, they're going to be nice. There is no reason to worry about it. I don't think it's a good solution so far. How many of you know this guy? It's Professor Kaczynski, Harvard graduated mathematician. In his manifesto, he was one of the early people to talk about this problem, and his solution was obviously wrong. As a computer scientist, I'm against it. His idea was to kill computer scientists to stop this technology. I don't support that. But some people take this to this level, just to give you an idea of how radical this can become. There is some uh, element in society who thinks we can integrate with machines in terms of our legal and social system. We'll just have them live with us, follow our laws, you know, try to earn money, basically implement them as we would any other immigrants to the country. Uh, I think there are problems with this approach. I don't know how we can implement a system of uh, punishments for a legal system which involves robots. It's not obvious, uh, this cartoon, I think, illustrates one of the potential problems with that. Another alternative solution is to say, okay, so they're gonna be smarter than us, but we need to compete. How can we become smarter? How can we remain competitive? And the idea is to, in some way, scan human brain and create a computer simulation of it, an upload. And then that system can be made faster, you can add memory to it, so it will become competitive. While I think it might work, I don't think it's a solution to the problem we are talking about of preserving humanity. If you are a program on a computer, you're more AI than a human, to me at least. So I don't think that's a right solution as yet. And this idea of uh, chaining artificial general intelligence is to say, okay, so I'm here, and super intelligence is there in terms of capacity. I can't really control it directly, but maybe I can control someone just a little smarter than me, and that person in turn, or that system in turn, can control something yet smarter, and so you have a chain all the way up to super intelligence. The problem is, of course, uh, anytime you have a long chain of command, things break down. Something gets lost in translation, and I don't think this is easier to implement than a single one link control. Some have suggested that maybe we should kind of plagiarize from how uh, nature did it, simulate evolution, and evolve moral agents. So we all here with kind of evolved morality. We understand, you know, some basic principles of living in society which benefit everyone. Maybe we can repeat this process. Of course, I don't think it's going to work yet again because of this uh, huge 
space of possible solutions. I showed you one with uh, space of mind designs, space of ethics and morals is not smaller. If anything, it's probably more complex. There are some ideas for creating a lot of restrictions and government regulations for future technologies. So this one in particular suggests, what if we created a first very smart system and then use that system to make sure no one else creates another system which is a bad system. This is bad on so many levels, I don't even know how to explain it all. So there is obvious government overregulation, and it's not gonna work because this system now is the problem we're fighting against. If you're a lawyer, you might enjoy this option. What if we created a legal machine language where we can very explicitly specify exactly how a machine is to behave in all situations? If you ever had to read small font on software or any agreement, that's the proposal. I suspect if human lawyers can find loopholes in our laws, a super intelligent system can definitely find super large holes in that approach. There is an idea of creating something called Oracle AI, and that's kind of like Google answers. So the system doesn't really take action, doesn't have manipulators, it just provides information. And at first glance, it seems like a very good idea, it might work, that's kind of like what my GPS does. I tell it, get me to this location, and it says it's not on a map. But uh, what people don't realize is that if a system is human level or beyond, it doesn't just stop at providing information, it starts considering well, how can I provide better answers? How can I acquire additional resources to improve user experience? And as a result of those side effects, we face the same problems we do with other systems. So that's not a solution either. And this is an interesting one, a simulation argument. So you create the system and you tell it that it is not in a real world, it's in a simulated world. It's a test. And if it behaves well, it will go to a good place. And if it's bad, it will be punished forever. Have you ever heard this solution before? <laughs> it doesn't always work to make sure a good behavior. So I, I, I don't encourage this approach. Probably the most famous solution is the three laws of robotics. How many of you heard of that? Asimov's science fiction. And that's exactly what it is. It's a beautiful literary tool to create amazing science fiction. It is designed to fail. The rules are contradictory. The rules don't have clear explanations. So then you say things like, protect a human. What does that really mean? Should I protect you from eating a donut? Should I you know, put you in a safe so you cannot get skin cancer from the sun? It's not clear how this to be implemented. And so it's very important to understand that this is not a way to implement a safe AI system. You cannot just have a set of rules, whatever is three rules or 10 rules, makes no difference, they tend to fail. A much more promising approach is kind of mathematical verification approach. We're starting to learn how to verify quality of our software for mission critical applications, sending something to space or nuclear power plants. Every line of code is examined and verified, usually automatically by other software, but this is what we want to learn, how to create a mathematical proof of correctness. So far we can do it with a lot of computational overhead for simple software which is not an independent intelligent agent. No one knows how to check behavior of intelligent agents in novel domains. So that's a completely open area of research. And then you talk about self-improving software, meaning the software is smart enough to be an engineer, a programmer on its own project and write version two, which writes version three and so on. No one knows how to make sure that whatever safety mechanisms you put in place with version one propagate to following versions. So one proposal I'm a big fan of, mostly because it's my proposal, is this idea of confining AI initially so we can study it, so we can make sure it's safe, Maybe we never release it, but at least for time being, we have some way of making sure it's as designed, it's doing what we want. So we have a project we're working on where we're creating this restricted environment, kind of like people who study computer viruses, 
have an isolated system from internet. But in this case, we also have to worry about social engineering attacks. How many of you saw Ex Machina? A recent movie about robot escaping from prison. So that, we're trying to prevent that movie from winning another Oscar. We developed a set of communication protocols where you control how much information goes into the system and how much can go out. And at the same time, it avoids any hidden information, steganographic back channels. So that's something I think we can try. It probably will fail long term. A really smart system will escape from any prison. We see it with maximum security prisoners and well-resourced uh, convicts. But uh, it's definitely not a negative to have this system as a first step. So I gave you a bunch of different methods. There is many, many others, and many are more technical than I want to bore you guys with. But I, I want to say something about the general concept of unethical research. So I think as scientific community, we come to agree that certain things should not be researched. We are against uh, research on biological weapons, chemical weapons. Uh, we are not big fans of synthetic biology when it comes to human cloning. So it seems like a very promising technology, but people said, we're not ready. We don't know how to do it right. Let's wait a little bit before we start doing it. So I'm kind of saying that software can be as dangerous as nuclear power plants or nuclear bombs or nuclear weapons. For this reason, I want the same approach we use with other technologies to be used with development of artificial general intelligence. So it's pretty standard now to have a university research board review any proposal for experiments on humans, on animals, with private data. But yet something where outcome can be really a new species of intelligent beings requires no review whatsoever. It seems inappropriate to me. One thing I want to point out is that a lot of research has taken place in this area of machine ethics. Or at least it feels like there is a lot. If you just look at different titles people came up with, there is dozens of different approaches and everyone says, well, we can have nice machines, we just have to implement my set of ethics into that machine and everything's going to be great. Problem is, we as humans, that little blue dot with shared common sense, can't agree on a single set of ethical principles. That's pretty much why we always argue, have wars, and so on. We are not in agreement. So I don't think any of those proposals will get us to where we want to be in terms of uh, ethical machine. So what am I saying? Should we make all research illegal? No, obviously not. That would be insane. It's super beneficial. We get a lot of benefit out of it in terms of, you know, assistive systems in terms of improvement or our capacity to make decisions. But there is a difference between systems which are only capable of working in narrow domains and systems which are capable of self-improving and doing better than all humans in all domains. So until we figure out how to control those systems, how to guide them towards you know, values inside of that little blue dot, I think we should have additional restrictions and reviews on anything which is artificial general intelligence. We still should continue investing in standard AI work. So I want to conclude by saying that uh, this is a huge issue. And it's going to be a big problem for many years to come. One thing I want to tell you for sure, any time you give a system power, you cannot take that power back. We already outsourced a lot of decision making to those machines. And it's just my hope that we never go to the next step, especially with military systems, where a decision to kill a human being is done automatically by machines. Because once that line is crossed, there is no undoing it. And we already have technical capacity to do it. The only reason we have humans in the loop right now is a logistical overhead. We just want to make sure it works well so somebody presses OK button. But that's not something which has to be there. And the moment some general in the military realizes they can shave two seconds of their mission time by removing that guy, they will remove that guy. 
So here's a quote from uh, Bill Joy, a famous computer scientist, again emphasizing how important this problem is. And I think you guys walk away from this talk thinking about it, at least for a while. I don't want you to have nightmares, but I do want you to consider what the future holds for you and maybe for your children. Mm -hmm.